Hello and welcome back to Kairos. I'm at Joshua Pfeiffer here today with Mr. Tim Stolzner to talk about Aboriginal ministry and mission. Tim, great to have you here. Good to be here too, Josh. Thanks for having me. So Tim Stolzno is the current chair of the Fink River Mission Board, is that right? That's correct. And this is a part of the Lutheran Church of Australia, which works in central Australia, particularly with our Indigenous people. So I wanted to talk to Tim today about Fink River Mission and various issues associated with that. Um, but we're going to go back and start somewhere else, which is in your childhood, Tim, because um, one of the um, unique perspectives perhaps that you bring to uh, this work is that you actually grew up for a number of years um, in a context of Aboriginal mission, if I'm correct. Can you tell sure. us a little bit about that? So, um, so in the early 60s, my dad was a, uh, was a lay missionary in Central Australia, um, in, in Alice, based in Alice Springs, but he travelled out to the remote communities, so this is right in the early days, um, of a lot of these people coming in from the Western Desert, from, uh, from uh, out in remote parts of Australia. So, um, so I was born in the mid '60s in Alice Springs, and uh, and that you know automatically gives you, I guess, a, a, a place uh, and and some sort of um, sense of of belonging in the centre. Um, Dad came back down to Adelaide um, for a few years to train as a pastor, but then he went back to Central Australia, and obviously uh, I went went back with him. I was a I was a young fellow. I did all my primary schooling in the centre and uh, we moved out um, when I was nine to a remote community called Papunya, which is on the edge of the Tanami, Tanami Desert um, in 1975 and uh, that was a, a pretty unique experience and I spent basically 10 years out of Papunya. I did um, schooling out there and got to be mates with, you know, Indigenous kids and learn how to speak. Uh, the, a, a bit of the language, certainly all the swear words, as you do when you're a young fella, and uh, and you know it was a it, it was a completely unique experience. There was no radio, no TV, uh, mail delivered once a week, um, no you know just one local general store that had a few basic supplies. So it was it was a very different upbringing. Yeah. And for those of uh, perhaps who aren't so aware of Australian history, when you say these people are coming in from the desert, you mean that quite literally. Can you tell us a little bit about what was actually happening around that time? What, what do you mean coming in from the desert? So, um, so in the 60s, um, there was a big drought. Um, so there was a lot of Aboriginal people that lived their traditional nomadic um, life. Um, they lived in family groups. Um, they practised their completely traditional kinship system and, and their, their dreaming or their, 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 uh, their culture. Uh, they were coming into uh, uh, white fellow communities or, mm. or government communities and mission communities that had been set up by the church or by the government, and uh, they were coming in uh, out of necessity, really, mm. uh, because they they didn't have food and uh, and water and uh, and tradi- you know three four hundred years ago they would have just died, mm. um, uh, but uh, th- these these places were. Uh, a, um, gave them a, a sense of refuge, and, and they were able to come into these uh, these spaces and uh, and and get government rations or uh, or, or supplies or, mm. or mission supplies. So it's just quite incredible, I think, how recent it is. Really, like you know, I think for, for some perhaps international listeners or viewers, um, you know, we're only we're not talking that that long ago that yeah. there was the, there was the first contact with white people yeah. for some time. So so even um, I think the most recent. Um, People came in probably in the in the early nineties. Certainly in the seventies, when we lived at Papunya in the eighties, there were um, there were Aboriginal people coming in from the desert who had never seen white people before, or mm. who had certainly never lived in a house, or lived in, or, or got supplies from the local store and tea and sugar and and bread and those sorts of things. Mm. Um, that just uh, was completely um, new to their whole culture. So tell us a little bit more about what you remember of your dad's ministry um, out in Papunya and your life growing up there. Um, what was it like to, you know, to, to be in that context with the church and the community around there? Um, it was, uh, I think as I alluded to before, it was a pretty unique experience. Um, I had uh, mostly Indigenous kids as, as mates. There were, there were white fella kids and there were Aboriginal kids and, uh, and I went to a 
to to a school when and whether it was right or wrong, it was a government school. The, the the white fella kids went in one class, and the Aboriginal kids went in other classes, and mm. and uh, and I was the only student in my year group. Um, mm. But um, so there would have been seven or eight kids in our class over over five, maybe five different grades, and we had you know uh, one teacher. Um, we used to go to the the local waterhole once a week. We, uh, we we had kangaroo in the schoolyard. We um, we we played the games that the we shot each other with shanghais and and we uh, you know and little berries and we killed lizards and we had you know we did the sorts of things that the Aboriginal kids would do um, and uh, we rode our bikes um, and really that was it. Um, mm. It was a pretty remote. It was a pretty remote place. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, no grass, no bitumen roads, no, yeah. um, you know, none of the modern conveniences that uh, that that you would come to expect in in a in a town now. Mm. Uh, so. And I'm interested too in the in the, the church scene out there in those days. I mean, also no powerpoints and <laughs> you know probably not not much other way of musical instruments. I mean, what did it actually look like to, to you know was there a church building in Papunya in those days? And so by the time we were there in the in the seventies, there were Aboriginal church workers, mm. uh, Lutheran Aboriginal church workers that were. That were we had a church, a physical church um, where, where worship took place every Sunday, and um, service was led by um, Aboriginal mm-hmm. um, people uh, in language. Mm-hmm. Um, and my dad was really there as a as a supporter. Yeah. Um, sometimes he took church service. Sometimes he might have taken a funeral if it was um, not culturally appropriate for some of the, uh, the, the the local church leaders to take that funeral. Dad would uh, travel around. There were some some communities outside of Papunya that were little family groups of maybe only thirty or forty people. He would travel around there, Bible studies and that sort of thing. But really, the church was uh, we we the, the mission's goal was to, to to encourage the church to be self sufficient, to to be self supporting. Um, and so, Tim, for those um, who aren't so familiar with the history up there and the history of the mission and Hermansburg, perhaps you can fill in a little bit of the backstory for us. So, um, so Hermansburg was established in the 1870s. That um, two uh, Lutheran missionaries um, went from the Barossa Valley in South Australia. Um, it took them two years to get up to Central Australia. Now, um, I remember I, I did an assignment on this. I just remember when right. I was at the SEM. You know, it's an yeah. incredible story. Yeah, it yeah. is. It was Kempy and Schwartz That's were right. the two uh, were the two missionaries, and they went up there and they 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 turned up. There's nothing, of course. There's really nothing in Central Australia, and they established. The mission buildings, some mission buildings. They, um, it took them years to learn, get to have a relationship with the local people, learn the language. Um, uh, but it was a really tough existence, uh, and they, they they established the mission in good times. But you know, there can be long periods of drought in Central Australia. There can be short periods of of uh, of, of bounty and and you know, uh, uh, plenty of greenery and f- full water holes. But um, long periods of drought. So they actually abandoned the mission. Um, in the early in the early eighteen nineties, and then this other um, missionary called Strelo came up there, and Strelo was legendary and and, uh, and and a very significant person in Central Australia and in in, in understanding Indigenous culture. He recorded their their their, their ceremony. He he wrote down their songs. He learnt the language. He he established a very strong relationship of trust with the Aboriginal people. Matter of fact, his son. Ted Strelo was a very famous anthropologist mm. for Central Australia, but so Strelo sort of kept the mission going until the uh, until the early twenties, and then another um, another German missionary, a German Lutheran missionary called uh, F. W. Albrecht, uh, arrived there, and he he was a builder. He, he well, he was a good missionary too, but he was very business business like. Uh, he there were a lot of uh, Aboriginal people dying from scurvy because mm. there wasn't enough. Um, um, Fresh fruit, uh, fruit and vegetables, and and the the bush tucker had died out in the early 30s because of a, a massive drought. So he organised to have a, a, a pipe built from a lo- from from a from a spring, Caprilia Springs, for, which was about nine miles um, mm. out of ceramic pipes um, into the community, and they were able to establish a vegetable garden and date palms and and feed the community. And of course, uh, other uh, other people came in. He. Uh, he he protected the uh, the Aboriginal people or helped protect the Aboriginal people from 
because what was happening is the cattle station owners were putting cattle up there and the cattle were eating out of the grass and so the kangaroos were dying and then the Aboriginal people had to eat so they'd kill, kill a cow and, mm. and then the, 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 um, the station owner would be angry and the police would go out and they'd round up the Aboriginal people and horrifically in some situations, you know, Aboriginal people were, were killed uh, because of this. Um, so they were able to find a real, uh, a real place of safety in the, in the mission. Mm. And, uh, and we established, we, the Fink River Mission, uh, established a tannery. We ran the store. We ran the the the, the school, the clinic, the garage, um, and had quite an you know it was quite an industrious, little productive community through the uh, through the forties and fifties mm. and sixties, and then in the in then in the eighties with uh, with the advances in self determination and different new government policies, the church handed um, handed everything. Back to the local Aboriginal people, so mm. um, so really um, that that that's all now. It's government. It's a government. Uh, the old Hammondsburg Mission is is a is a is a community like any other community, mm. um, even though it has this this wonderful uh, heritage. And so um, you grow up out there at Papunya, and um, your your whole life's journey up until now has been very interesting, and that's uh, maybe a, uh, another discussion, but. Um, you find yourself at the end of a um, career in, in business then as the chair of the Fink River Mission Board. So um, your life seems to have had, had this circle about it to end up back where you uh, grew up. Um, and so how did you end up back in this space of Aboriginal ministry um, and mission? So, so very quickly, I, I came down for secondary college. There was no, no secondary school at Papunya. I came down to Adelaide for secondary college. I went on to university, became an engineer, lived and worked uh, in Adelaide and in the US and other places, um, and that was a great journey. Um, in 2010, um, at, at, as I was coming to, a, I guess, a pivot in my career, um, I was approached by the then um, president, as it was then, now, the bishop of the church, um, Mike Semler, to come into this role and I, I have to say, I was pretty reluctant. I, my dad had worked for Fink River Mission for 17 years, and um, and I knew what a complicated, uh, a complex environment it was. Um, and it really took probably two months of pretty deep soul searching mm. before I accepted the role. Um, but having having sort of made the decision to get involved, I have to say, going back to Alice Springs. The first time as chair of Fink River Mission, so this organisation that my dad had worked for as a as a missionary for all mm. that time, um, and 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 that place where I grew up, the smells, the sights, um, the the uh, you know that j just being there was was a pretty moving experience for me. So mm. uh, I've I guess I've I've felt a, a bit of a calling mm. um, in this role and. Um, and I think that uh, you know that there's a lot of other people uh, for Fink River Mission that are that are involved with it, but this is a this is a good position for me that utilises the skills that I have and the uh, and the experience um, mm. that I've that I've had in my life. So. Was it that sense of calling that got you over the line in those couple of months of soul searching, as you put it, or what, was there anything that tipped you towards? Taking it up, well, apart from the fact that Mike Semmel is a fairly persuasive <laughs> character. <laughs> Look, uh, I, I, I think it was probably the sense of calling. Mm. Um, you, you know, I, I looked around and I thought, well, you know, if not me, then who? Um, you know, uh, you know, someone. This is a very important role, and Fink River Mission still has a um, and still plays a really uh, important role in Central Australia. Um, in, and we can talk about some of those different areas that mm. Fink River Mission's involved with, but um, but it, it, it's it, it's important and um, it's got to be it's got to be sustainable. We, we mm. you know Fink River Mission's been around for pretty well 140 years um, in some capacity. There's no reason why. It, 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 Strictly speaking, it's probably not a mission anymore per mm. se, but but you know it is called Fink River Mission, and we're we're staying with that at the moment. And uh, there's no reason why we can't be there to w walking alongside 
our brothers and sisters in Central Australia for another 140 yeah. years. We were just talking about this sort of dynamic before we started recording today about how sometimes when, when the idea is in your, your head or your heart and you think somebody should, should be doing this, then often it ends up being you, you're the one. You yeah, know? yeah. No. Um, and so, yeah, so we started to talk a bit more generally about, about what's going on up there. So perhaps we can um, give us maybe first a bit of an overview about, I mean, what are we actually talking about? What is Fink River Mission and what, or what is the Lutheran Church's presence in Central Australia these days? Um, and then we can get onto a few more specific issues, perhaps. So, Fink River Mission today um, is uh, is Urara College, which is an Indigenous boarding college. For it's, we've got two campuses. We've got about 100 staff, maybe about 300 um, uh, 300 students. It does vary a little bit during the year, um, but that's that that serves a very important role. Um, we have Indigenous kids from all over remote and very remote Australia. So they're coming in from communities that wouldn't have a secondary schooling opportunity and these kids are coming into a culturally um, comfortable environment for them. Um, they mightn't be able to go to a, a school in Sydney or in Melbourne but they can come to a place like Urara and we can give them an opportunity or we can help them um, create their own opportunities to um, have productive experience in their lives, um, a more learning experience in their lives when they go back to their communities and they are able to contribute to their families and their, and their communities in a, in a worthwhile uh, way. It does serve a very, the, the college serves a very good role and we've got a lot of very committed um, people there. About 40% of our kids um, would come from Lutheran mm -hmm. backgrounds, so um, it's quite, um, quite a Lutheran school. That, that, that college was actually handed to us, to the, to the Fink River Mission, at the request of the, of the local Aboriginal people I was about to back in the early that, 90s yeah. because the government had tried to run it for 20 years and, yeah. and not done a, a, a great job. It was really, it had I really fallen that, into yeah. <laughs> disrepair. So, so we've run it for the last 25 years and, uh, and with varying degrees of success and yeah. uh, you know I think Urara is in a relatively good place now. So that's Urara. We also have, um, a, we run a general store in one of the communities in Hermansburg, uh, again at the request of the local people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a whole lot of challenges with different models for running stores in remote communities but we don't need to go into that. Mm -hmm. Fink River Mission runs the run out at Hermansburg. We also out at Hermansburg, there's a there's a historic precinct. There's the old German missionary, the old German Lutheran community, the settlement there. So there's buildings, um, classic German buildings that, that that exist out in the middle of this you know outback area, on the edge of this creek bed, on the edge of this on the edge of the Fink River, um, that were built in the eighteen in the late eighteen hundreds, um, and uh, it's now a tourist. Uh, attraction, um, and so we we maintain that again at the request of the local community. We we have a manager in there and and staff, and we operate that as a uh, as a you know seven day a week tourist um, venture. Um, and then the, the the primary the primary um, task that we have up there is that we have um, pastors that we employ that um, that represent that go out into or live in each language area. So uh, this area would be the size of, um, the, the area of Fink River Mission is the size of Victoria, um, maybe in the US size, uh, you know, the size of Colorado, uh, mm -hmm. or even a little bit larger probably. Um, and we have five language groups. Um, we have Pitindjara, uh, Pinabi Luricha, Anmanchara, Alyara, and Aranda. Mm -hmm. And each language area has its own Communities. It may, may have, you know, five or ten or fifteen different communities there. Each community has its own church leaders, and we have support workers, quite often pastors, that go out into these communities and support the Aboriginal church yep. that exists in that community. Yeah. So, think so, finger of mission. You you employ the white fellows, basically. If I'm yep. hearing you right, yep. support workers, whether they be pastors or, or lay people, the the the, the churches and, and the communities, they, they essentially um, uh, lead themselves and, and you support them, is yep. what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, but we've actually progressed to the point where we actually have an Aboriginal pastor now who does that role as well. So we mm. do employ 
Aboriginal people too, mm-hmm. um, but we we also have and support about twenty Lutheran pastors mm-hmm. who are Indigenous, mm-hmm. um, who who live and work in in their own communities, mm-hmm. um, and then on, I, I guess in, we probably have another forty church leaders that would be um, significant volunteers, sometimes even paid. That uh, that work in their church um, in their church families as well. And so, are you aware, off the top of your head, um, roughly how many um, Indigenous people there would be in Central Australia who would identify with a Lutheran church? So it's a bit. Um, th- that's a good question. There's probably our best estimates. There's a census. The Australian census um, is around five thousand. Mm-hmm. So it's actually um, a pretty significant portion of the population. Mm. Um, and uh, and it's a that, that's a lot of people to to serve over over when they're scattered over such a wide geographic area. So mm. yeah, and are they generally in your experience? Um, are they generally? How do they feel about the Lutheran Church and this you know th- this this heritage? And I'm sure you're aware that one of the reasons that I'm asking is that this is a somewhat controversial issue in our culture and the whole history of interaction between. Christian missionaries and Indigenous peoples. From your experience, how, how are those relationships between the people and um, our church? You know, that, I, I think that's a, that's a really good and important question. Um, the, the, the Lutheran missionaries that went up there in the early days um, wrote down the language. They, it had never been written down before the, and, and wrote down the languages. There's lots of languages in Central Australia and, they, and, and the Lutherans were the best linguists because they lived and worked in these communities and they wrote down the language. They taught in the schools. Um, the Lutherans taught these kids to read and write in their own language and, and adults to live and uh, read and write in their own language. Um, and they translated hymns and, and church liturgy and the Bible and, um, and prayers into, into local language. So, um, so we have a very strong relationship um, which we don't take for granted, but um, a very strong relationship with the Indigenous people in Central Australia. A- and it really is a relationship based on trust. And, um, and, and many, you know, the, the, the church leaders now that you talk to, and they've said this publicly, they'll say it in, in, in the, the, the media if they have the opportunity to say it, um, is that they, the Lutherans protected the, the culture. They protected the language. They wrote it down. And they've, and one of the reasons why, even though you might only have one or two thousand speakers of a particular language, the fact is that it is written down, even mm. if it is in the form of a Bible or a Bible stories or mm. or a or a, a hymn, mm. a, a, a song. Mm. So, mm. Uh, so it's that that's that's very powerful. And the, the other thing that's very important, I guess, is there's been a lot of talk in Australia about the stolen generation. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and the, the, in the Lutheran missionaries in Central Australia, there was no stolen generations. The Lutherans were, uh, or the missions were seen as a place of refuge. Mm-hmm. And uh, and there were there were there are people alive today that will that will speak on camera and have spoken on camera and said that the Lutheran uh, missionaries protected them and stopped the government from taking the kids away. Mm-hmm. Um, now uh, that's that, that's very important and, and uh, something that uh, has has helped build on that trust that we have that mm. that, that we've been able to uh, vouch for Aboriginal people as their as their own identity as as people that are that that have have rights and have have you know a proud tradition mm. and uh, and have a very important um, you know and intelligent and sophisticated culture. That many people wouldn't understand. Mm, mm. I think it's, it's, it is a really important part of the conversation to be having in our country, and we're you know by by no means saying, of course, that the uh, that we've, you know, the Lutheran Church has never made mistakes up there, or that the Christian Church has um, a completely clean record in missions. But it's a much more complex story than is sometimes made out um, at, 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 here around the traps. So, so yeah. thank you for commenting on that. Another issue I don't know that we've talked about before briefly, which you may or may not want to comment on, is there's all these these indigenous folk up there who have churches and they identify as Lutheran. Um, and I know there sometimes has been a little bit of a disconnect in how we integrate those communities into our very Western you know, structure of, of church. Um, and just do you have any comments on that about you know, the challenges there or, or the, the way forward in the future? And, so, you know. so we have, um, 
we have our own, I guess the church is a fairly traditional church with its structures of congregations and physical places of worship and, and constitutions and, and, you know, elders and, and, mm. and whatnot. Um, the, 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 the church has evolved in Central Australia to the point where it's the Indigenous church that they set for themselves. Mm. There's a lot of um, complications with... Um, that we don't understand or that I, I certainly don't understand and, and most people from outside of these communities wouldn't wouldn't understand. They, they may have some appreciation for, but many actually don't even understand Indigenous culture in that there's a, there's a very strong kinship system and the kinship system dictates what you can say in front of others, mm -hmm. depending on, you might be on this part, of, this part of the country, on this land here, you can say certain things, on that land over there, you can't. So, you know, how you relate to people... Um, depends on who you're speaking to, mm -hmm. what their relationship is to you, where you are, mm -hmm. and all sorts of other things that may seem to us to be um, uh, maybe a, a little bit silly. Well, just, uh, just but part it's of their culture, culture yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, we'll look at that and go, well, well, how come you can't say that in front of that one? You, you just can't. So, mm -hmm. um, so Aboriginal c culture is different, mm -hmm. right? It's different to what, we're, uh, what we uh, are used to. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that, that that creates a whole lot of complexities when 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 the church wants to get together and have a big power, big meeting, and make decisions about its future. That's quite difficult to get some of these traditional Aboriginal Lutherans from a remote community like Mount Liebig or uh, Arulcha or and Blatterwich and and drag them into Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane and and get them to sit around a table and talk about what what's meaningful for them in their communities. Mm, mm. Um, so we have a we have our own. Um, our own sort of congress or, or our own process. We have what's called bush courses. So three times a year, all the church leaders get together. They get together with uh, with people that can walk in both worlds. Mm. They get together with um, with ch with our own church leaders and with other with other leaders who 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 can uh, who have established relationships of trust. And these uh, men and women are able to talk about their church mm. and what they want and what's important to them. And that's that's very important for the way Fink River Mission functions. Yeah, is okay. this is this what we call bush courses, which um we you know, the government is just amazed quite often that, you know, we will have a, a group of original people that will drive six hundred kilometres, four hundred miles to to a, a, a bush course, mm -hmm. they'll pay for their own fuel. They'll come in and for a week we'll sit down in in the desert or in a in a creek bed or by a mountain uh, and talk about the future of the church or talk mm. about some aspect of uh, of 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 their life. Mm. Uh, and one of the reasons I'm interested in how um, you know we and the rest of the church can keep working towards ways of better um, you know, integrating ourselves with our Indigenous brothers and sisters is that I'm, I'm sure there are so many ways in which we can be enriched by, by their culture and by particularly their, their expression of Christian faith. And so I guess I'm wondering, another question is, um, you know, do you have any thoughts about ways in which we can learn from Aboriginal brothers and sisters and that, that Indigenous church, ways in which we could be enriched by them? They want to be respected. Um, respect is really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you know, if, if we go into their community, uh, it, it would be only reasonable that you say, you, you know, if you're going to take photos, you ask them, if you're going to take, can you take a photo? Uh, if, if you want to, um, if, if you want to sit down with them and, and, and talk to them, you first of all need to understand a little bit about their culture. Mm -hmm. um, so what sort of questions are even appropriate um, you know, asking an Aboriginal person their name, for example, can be a bit like asking someone what their date of birth is. Right. So, so you really shouldn't ask an Aboriginal person, a tr really traditional Aboriginal person, their name until you have a, have a relationship of trust with them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of white fellas don't understand this sort of thing, and they'll come out and fire a whole lot of questions, and this person just, the Aboriginal person might just think, well, this person's just nosy, mm -hmm. um, or they might just think they're naive. Mm -hmm. um, but either way, it's not establishing a, a great relationship. So there's there's things that are acceptable or, or, or more acceptable or more appropriate than, mm -hmm. than others, and, you know, there's some, there's some really good books out there Mm. on culture and there's a, there's one book called I think it's called Blackfella Whitefella 
um, and um, it looks at whitefellow culture from an Aboriginal perspective. Mm -hmm. And it actually says that it's actually, you know, from a, Aboriginal people can look at white fellas and think, we're pretty, you know, those guys are pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way, we might look at them and think, think, think similarly. So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's understanding culture, mm -hmm. understanding where they're coming from. They're not dumb. They're not lazy. Mm -hmm. They just have a different way of looking at the world mm -hmm. a, as we do mm -hmm. to them. And I've, one of the things I've heard from um, some of the people that have been involved in the bush courses is, is just that sometimes their insights into scripture, because of their traditional culture, can be very helpful for us. You know, they see things, they connect with things that, you know, we might read and think in the Old Testament thing, what's all this about? I'm skipping over that whole section, whereas they really get into it, you know. And so these sorts of things, it's, it, they could be a real benefit, you know, for the rest of the church, I think. Yeah, yeah definitely. The, 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 the ceremony part of the church is very powerful in okay. indigenous culture. Mm. Whereas there's a lot of other things that Aboriginal people, you know, if you would say something like to them, the writing's on the wall, they would look at you and go, the writing's on the wall. <laughs> What's that mean? You know, mm. so, so we say things and just take it for granted. Yeah. Um, and, and it really is, it just complicates the, the, the building of that relationship. Mm. Mm. Um, and so what are the... What are the challenges for Fink River Mission going forward, or what's exciting? What's on the horizon up there in the future? So we need to um, we need to continue to, to to support the church up there. One of the one of the things for us is to uh, increase the representation at within the Lutheran Church at Synod, mm -hmm. um, but we need to do that sensitively and in a way that. Um, that allows the Aboriginal people to 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 come at, at, at their at their own pace as as they want to. So, we've got um, we've got some initiatives which are probably more what I'd say is white fellow initiatives. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not that they come along and say we we want we have to do this or we we want to do right. that. Uh, we're working with them to to work out the best way to enable that. Mm. How we uh, can hear their voice? Yeah, well, hearing their voice mm. is a big challenge, and mm. uh, and we. We at, at FRM um, have some very skilled people. We have, uh, I'm thinking of an Aboriginal, uh, a white fellow pastor, sorry, that lives out in community. He's lived out there for 20 years. He knows the people intimately. Um, you know, these people are very important as bridges mm. back. And, and there are Indigenous people now that serve in that role, mm. that, are, that, that are bridges between, um, between the two cultures. Mm. And, and we need to... Um, we need we, we need role models. We need um, we we need to build these people up uh, at, at at their own pace, at their own in their own time, so that they can be leaders within their communities and um, and can can communicate effectively in, in the rest of you know um, society in Australia. Mm, mm. Um, so it's it's a challenge, and it's going to take time. But uh, as we said before, it's only you know thirty years sometimes since these people walked in from the desert, yeah. and their culture's been around for, depending on what books you read, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand years, and that's a lot of change in yeah. you yeah. know fifty years. Yeah. And so you um, had these years growing up out in Papunya, and then you found yourself in this um, this with this calling later in life, and um, how are you feeling about it now, and how have you how have you um, you yourself been blessed by your time with FRM and grown in it, and um, are you going to be around for a while? Do you think? Or, yeah. Well, um, you know, I think the job's obviously not without its frustrations, mm. but um, and and sometimes my uh, my my energy struggles, especially when you look at the the the, the corporate risk management governance of the church and corporate Australia, and where's all that heading? And how we make that fit into a complex world in Central Australia yeah. is a real challenge, yeah. and it's not without its risks. It's challenging enough in the middle of a city. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so you know, I, I have my frustrations with mm. even with the church about mm. uh, about uh, how how we um, how we communicate and how we uh, how we get things done. You know, it's it's different in Central Australia and. Mm. Uh, and so, that, so, so that, that's part of my role is to try and shield a little bit f f the, the Central Australian story mm -hmm. so that we don't end up smothering 
smothering a very delicate flower, if mm. you like, um, with uh, with this sort of corporate talk and jargon and, and, and obligations and regulations. So, um, so I, 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 I mean, I'll be around as long as the board. I mean, we have a we have a we have a great board. Mm. We have uh, people that have lived and worked in remote communities, people that speak Indigenous language. Mm. Um, we have, um, you know, people that 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 have a lot to offer. So, providing I can continue to lead the board and keep the faith of the, you know, trust of support of the board, then um, I think that you know I'll, I'll be doing it for a few more years yet. Mm. Mm. And if anyone uh, wants to. Um Learn more about Finger River Mission. Where where should they go? Just just search it on Google, and they'll find a website or something like that. So there's a few things. Um, so so we did. We, there's a lot of things that are happening in Central Australia, but there's this one story which I'll just let, mm. tell you about, um, which is the Ab Aboriginal uh, Central Australian Aboriginal Women's Choir, which is a great story. So the the choirs that were established by the German missionaries. They still exist today. So we have these communities that have Aboriginal choirs. They sing some of the hymns they sing um, don't even have an English translation. They were translated from German into uh, an Indigenous language in Central Australia, and these these ladies are still singing these uh, and men are still singing these uh, the, these hymns. So the Central Australian Women's Choir a few years ago um, did a tour back to Germany. Uh, which was really powerful, and it was recorded in this movie documentary called The Song Keepers. Mm. And if, if anyone wants to try and get their hands on that, that movie, it's called The Song Keepers. It shows on uh, SBS every once in a while. It was on TV the other night. It's a, it's a fantastic story. There's some other things uh, on iView. There's ABC's done some great stories. They did one called um, The Bush Preachers, which is on iView, mm -hmm. which is really powerful. But there's lots of material on the internet. There's a Fink River Mission website. Mm. And then if, if you really do feel, um, uh, you know, engaged or uh, uh, as though it's a, something that you want to do, then go to Central Australia mm. and, and go to Hermansburg mm. and learn about the culture and meet some of the people. But, you know, and, but treat it sensitively. Mm. Treat it sensitively. So. And I know we do have a number of um, pastors and church workers who, who listen and, and to and watch these uh, videos. And so um, I imagine that, you know, they should, you, you would encourage people to be open to the possibility of a call up there one day and helping out. Yeah. Things come oh, up absolutely. There. Yeah. Mm. If, you, if, you know, it doesn't matter what skills you have, there's, mm. there's, plenty, of, uh, there's plenty of opportunities in Central Australia and, uh, and, you know, the Lutherans in Central Australia certainly look at other Lutherans with, a, you know, in a, in a very trusting way, you know, mm. that, that they, they love being part of the Lutheran church. Mm. And uh, they've got their own Lutheran heritage now. Mm. And, uh, and if there are people that want to live and work in Central Australia for, six, for, the, for, the, for the southern winter or for, you know, for six months, for a year, for two years, for ten years, there's, uh, there is a lot of really worthwhile uh, roles that, uh, that can be done up there. And it's really important um, that, that we have, you know, that that relationship continues to, to uh, be nurtured. Mm -hmm. Well, Tim, thanks again for uh, this discussion today. We really appreciate these insights uh, into the work happening for Christ and the gospel in Central Australia. And um, God bless you and the whole Fink River Mission team. Thank you very much, Josh. Thank you. Mm -hmm.